a bug, but at least now it's obvious to you, the human, the programmer, wait a minute, this is clearly not what I expected. I'm doing something wrong. So, what's the solution perhaps to this? What do, how do we fix this problem of buffer being some unknown value? You know, can I do something a little crazy like, well, null is obviously bad. I know that much. Well, let's put it at this address I keep quoting as popular. Well, we could do that, but what you're really saying, now you're just arbitrarily saying put what the user types over there. And you have no idea where there is. So, what function can we call that gives me a memory address of a legitimate chunk of memory? That's right. So, the solution here is malloc. So, we could try this. So, give me a string that's of size, oh, the user's not going to type in a word that's more than like 10 characters. So, I'm going to hard code 10. Now, this should actually work because malloc, assuming there's RAM left in the computer, is going to give me a pointer and it's going to say put this word that the user types here in memory. And that address is now stored in buffer. So, scanf will put it there. Now, let me go ahead and try compiling this. Let me recompile it with GCC. Oh, implicit declaration of function malloc. So, we've not had to do this manually yet because the, libra the CS50 library is usually doing this for us. But there's another header that's popular standard lib, standard library.h. And that should make GCC happy now, not knowing about malloc. And indeed it did. So, scanf2, and go ahead and type monkey. Nice. Thanks for the monkey. All right, but wait a minute. Uh, monkey, monkey, monkey. Enter. Interesting. So that kind of worked, but monkey, 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 with no spaces. Interesting. But what's happening here actually is that we are getting lucky. Let me see if I can make us unlucky by doing this ad nauseum. Let's see. Well, that doesn't work. So let's do paste. Let's do paste. Let's do paste. Let's do zoom out. Let's do paste. Now, obviously, a user is not typically going to do something like this, but imagine it's actually, you know, a form field on a web page where, oh, it's still working. So <laughs> I'm getting a little bored copying and pasting, but take my word for it today um, that if we did this long enough, we would traverse one of those segmentation barriers where right now we're within it and we're just getting lucky, but we're going to cross over it at some point, and in fact, it's going to. Crash on us. Again, segmentation fault. So, how do you fix this? Well, this is actually harder to fix. And now is the CS50 libraries get string function motivated. Recall, we looked at it briefly on Monday. And any time you call get string, how many characters does it get at a time? Well, recall it used a new function, get character, get char, and it just got one at a time, one at a time. It's incredibly paranoid, the get string function that we wrote, so that it only slowly looks at what the user's typing in. And only if it realizes, wait a minute, you just typed in 11 characters, but I've only allocated 10 bytes, what is it going to do? Well, recall we saw briefly the realloc function, which is like a cousin of malloc. And realloc, as its name suggests, takes the 10 bytes that you might have already allocated with malloc and doubles it. Or triples it, and we repeat this process. So why was getString relatively complex compared to this? For this simple reason. There are so many programs to this day written out there where the, you, the programmer has made a arbitrary and ultimately dangerous decision to say, no one's going to have a name longer than 16 characters or 1,000 characters. But these are precisely the opportunities that bad guys look for trying to crash programs. Because again, we saw on Monday this opportunity for a buffer overflow exploit, which essentially means typing something a little more sophisticated than monkey, 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 but rather code that you want to execute. And you can trick the computer into overflowing this buffer and executing your adversarial code. Yeah? The word string does not exist. It's in CS50.h. Uh, good, good question. Coincidence. So percent %s is part of C. It's part of printf. And percent %s, so the word string exists in programmer's vocabulary, but the data type string does not exist in C. So percent %s denotes char star. Mm -hmm. uh, really good question. So I'm contradicting myself here, right? In the previous example with, S, with scanf1, recall that I did this. I per passed in per, uh, ampersand x to get the address of x. But we can kind of answer this just with our own jargon. What is buffer already? 
it's a memory address. So I don't need to use ampersand because I already have the answer to the question. The question is going to be where do you want me to put the user's input? Well, put it at that address. And the fundamental difference here is that in the previous example, we allocated an int, it was on the Uh, stack as a local variable, there was no malloc involved. But as soon as you involve malloc, what you're literally getting is that address. So we don't need to use the ampersand in this case. And realize there's one other way we can create a buffer that's just as dangerous as hard coding a length. A very common approach in a program is to say something like char buffer bracket 16. So, char buffer 16 doesn't feel like a memory address really, but it is in fact an array of characters. And what though is an array? Well, an array really is just the address of the first chunk of memory. So, what is this really doing? This also is allocating not 10, but 16 bytes this time. It's then passing the word of the name of the array, buffer, to scanf. And think back now to pset. Three, when you implemented sort or search, remember that you could pass in an array as an argument to a function and you didn't use the double brackets, you instead just wrote the array's name. That's because you can pass an array by its name, by its address. And so scanf here would use that 16 byte buffer to put the user's input. But what's going to happen if the user types in 17 characters? Just by nature, by definition, you're going to go beyond the boundaries of that array. And notice, too, in C, scanf and your own code has no idea how big the original array is. It has no idea how many bytes you asked malloc for. It is entirely up to you, the programmer, to remember how many bytes you asked for or how many bytes you hard coded in the array. And so, again, this is the one of the primary reasons that so much code written in C and C, and even in some modern Modern languages is in fact、uh, exploitable、um, because of these kinds of dangers. And if you don't believe that too, realize that these languages that you might already know a little bit, we certainly will by semester's end, like JavaScript and PHP and Python and Ruby, a lot of the times the programs called interpreters that you use to use those l a n g u a g e They're written in C themselves. So you might be writing PHP code, but it's being executed by a C program. So if that C program is buggy, your PHP code can be vulnerable as well. Yeah. Uh, good question. So, if the buffer is an address, why do we u- not say star buffer as we did in our swap function on Monday? So, the reason again boils down to the fundamental question we're trying to answer here. The question at hand for scanf is where do you want me to put the user's input? The answer to that question must be an address, but we already have an address. Malloc gave us an address. So, the simple answer to why we need no star and no ampersand here is because buffer is already an address. Because in this case, we called malloc. And as, we're, as I'm、uh, disclosing today,、uh, the name of an array can be treated as though it is a pointer as well, an address. The only time we use the star is when we want to go there. Scanf will do star buffer. We do not.、Uh, yeah. Is that 16 characters? 16 characters, 16 of whatever the data type is in green. Uh, no, it's still going to be 16 bytes. A char is one byte. It's eight bits. So in this case, we would get literally 16 bytes or 16 chars. If it instead were int buffer 16, then we would get 64, because it'd be four bytes per integer. All right. All right. So recall then. With the danger that this leads to, right? We saw this picture and we kind of lambasted this design because you have this dangerous pointer called the return address in red, and that was simply the address of what? What was this red return address used for? It tells a function what? This is the return address. It's literally return address. It tells a function where it should return control of the computer to once it's done doing its thing. So if I'm the main function and I call the foo function, what I'm essentially doing conceptually is I main. I'm going to say I am address 12345. You hand this piece of paper to foo. Foo keeps it around in this red slice of memory. And as soon as foo is done executing, it checks where did main tell me to go back to? 1234. Let me hand control to the CPU back to the address that was on this piece of paper. But the The problem is that if foo has an, a buffer, say 16 bytes, or in this case 12 bytes, and the user types in not hello, but something much longer than that, where does the space go? It goes from top left to bottom. And so you run the risk ultimately of overwriting this 
with the address of some bad guy's code. And unfortunately, even though the simple solution might be to just say, all right, well, don't write hello from top down, write it from bottom up. Turns out that only makes the problem a little harder for the bad guys. But the problem is that you can end up tricking future functions that gets called、uh, into exploiting code. So there's actually not a simple fix for this. And again, this remains one of the most common ways of exploiting a program. Let's just peel back the layer of one other thing with regard to pointers. So, this here is a program called pointers.c. It's among our, print, uh, our uh, source code from today already. Notice that I'm using a few header files up here, using a few libraries, just because I wanted to resort to the CS50 library for this. And now, notice the one new habit I'm getting into is anytime I call getString, I now need to say if the return value equals equals null. Something went wrong. I should yell at the user, I should、uh, return, I should exit. So I'm now checking that value. Now, why can getString return null? Because it uses malloc, and malloc can return null. All right, so notice this trick, though. We have previously printed strings, and previously the syntax had been this, right? This should probably remind you a little bit of week one, week two. If you want to print a string that the user's typed in, it should remind you of pset2, the Caesar cipher in Visionaire. Well, I can print each character, percent %c, one at a time, and then I can print that character by way of s, the name of the string, bracket i. So, comfort with this, hopefully. So, it turns out that all this time, these square brackets are what we would generally call syntactic sugar. It's just a nicer, prettier way of doing something that, at the end of the day, is actually more sophisticated. This code here that I just wrote is equivalent to s bracket one. So, let's go back to the fundamentals. First of all, what is s? Well, s we call a string, but really, as of this week, what is s in more technical terms? It's an address, right? It is the address in RAM at which that string. Characters live from left to right. So, star s, recall, means go there. And if you go to that address, you're going to see the letter m, and then o, and then n, and then k if the word is monkey, right? If you go to that address, you're going to see those characters. But you don't want to go to the same address every time. You want to go to the start of the string, which is identified by the name s. But each time you iterate in this loop, how many steps to the right in memory do you want to look? Well, i, right? One more, one more, one more. So if inside of your loop you take this address, s, and you add i to it, well, the first time this loop goes through, i is initialized to what, apparently? Zero. So s plus zero is s. So what are you going to print first? You're going to print star s, which means go to that address and print out, if the word is monkey, the letter m. If you then take that same address and do plus one on your second iteration, that's not address one, two, three, four, that's like one, two, three, five. And what letter presumably is at that location? So O. So star of that summation means print the O, print the N, print the K, and so forth. And because we already checked in advance the length of S with this helpful function string length, we're not going to crash. We're only going to step over the characters one at a time and then we're going to stop. But just realize all this time, Even as far back as problem set two in Caesar, we've been using pointers. We've been using memory addresses. We've been walking through your computer's RAM, but we did it in a more user friendly way with s bracket i. But really, you've been using a feature called pointer arithmetic taking an address and doing some mathematical arithmetic on it, plus one, minus one. So realize all we've been doing is the same topic all this time. Yeah. Really good question. So, if we were instead iterating not over characters, which are one byte typically, but instead over ints, would we have to do plus four times i so that we go four bytes, four bytes, four bytes? Short answer no. The reason this feature has its own name, pointer arithmetic, is because the compiler will figure out that when you say s plus i, If s is actually a char star, it's going to do literally plus one. If instead, though, s is an int star, well, an int star points to an int by definition. Ints on this machine are four bytes, so plus one is actually going to be implicitly converted to plus four, then plus eight, plus 12, plus 16. So that's what's really cool about pointer arithmetic. You don't even have to think about those details. So your code will work on old machines, new machines, because the compiler will figure this out for you. Really good catch. All right. Yeah. 
Good question. Is this more computationally efficient than using square brackets?、Uh, no. The compiler will actually effectively turn your square brackets into this. So when your code's running, you will notice no difference.、Um, back in the day, you might notice a compilation difference, but these days on a 2 GHz computer, compiling Caesar is instantaneous anyway. So it's a non issue in modern times.